Well, Jeff, brother, it's hard to believe we're here in uh, season 14. Uh, we started this thing back in 2020, almost almost five years ago, uh, in the middle of the pandemic stuff. And things were unstable then, or even more unstable now in many ways, and many things have happened. So with that, uh, people just are eating these episodes up and are just hungry for the next season to drop. So here we are, uh, episode one of season 14. That's amazing. I, I don't even know. I think we're like 300 and something episodes into this thing. And, you know, I, I was uh, in uh, some, traveling somewhere this weekend and uh, someone came up to me and said, look, I, I, I binge listen. I binge watch you guys all the time. And I'm, I'm just thinking, gosh, I don't like anybody that much. So I would binge listen to them <laughs> just over and over again. But we're so humbled that, that you guys would because uh, it's just God's truth, you know. And as you said, starting during the time when you know, people are talking about all kinds of stuff during COVID. And yeah. We, we want to give you really a, a booster of encouragement and of knowledge uh, straight from the scripture. So, Todd, let's dive into this uh, topic today because this is a myth here that we need to bust uh, open pretty good here. So what, what yeah. are we talking about today? We really do. So today we're talking about the here's the myth we're going to bust today. The rapture is not in the Bible. And here's the crazy thing, you know, we, we often get email of people, you know, from people or, or correspondence from people who are maybe hold another view of the timing of the rapture. They think it's mid-trib, post-trib or whatever. And, you know, the, we have very strong convictions that it's pre-trib and it's crystal clear in scripture, but the, even the timing is more of an in-house debate. But of late, there's been a lot of attacks on the doctrine of the rapture itself. People saying it's not even in the scripture. And this, these arguments are coming from non-believers. These are coming from within the church. So that's, that's kind of what we're tackling today. We're going to help people yeah. bust this myth that people are claiming the rapture is not in the Bible. That's right. And you, you're getting it from people that um, have, a, 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 I think, a, enough knowledge to be dangerous. Uh, they've heard it. You know, it said that the rapture was started in the 1830s with John Darby, which we'll address that in a minute. Uh, they, they talk about you can't find it anywhere in the Bible. Well, mm -hmm. uh, let's just go ahead and admit, I mean, the word rapture is not in the Bible. It's not in your English Bible. In fact, no Greek words are in your English Bible. <laughs> but uh, but there are also other words that are not found in your Bible. You can look from Genesis to Revelation. You're never going to find Trinity, Incarnation. Christmas, Easter, missions, none of those words are in the Bible. Uh, these are words that we use to help us understand doctrines that we believe are taught in the Bible. And, and Todd, when I, when I look at uh, this, what the Scripture says in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, there is an event that is undeniable. Uh, to yeah. deny the rapture is to deny the Bible because mm -hmm. it's in the Bible. Now, again, we can have healthy debate on whether it happens before, during, or after the tribulation, but there is no denying it is 100% in the Bible. Yeah. So where do we go from here with that argument? Yeah, that's that's what's wild. And uh, maybe we can look at some of those specific arguments first mm -hmm. and then show our viewers and listeners from Scripture, you know, those exact key texts yeah. that you're talking about. Because like you said, it, it's crystal clear in the Scripture. Um, yeah. But I, I've watched a few videos of some of the people arguing, saying that there is not uh, the rapture. Uh, there's a few more out there I haven't had a chance to watch, but from seasoned uh, theologians who have been to at least Bible college and many of them to seminary, some of them work, you know, on, have worked on staff at some major Christian organizations and their, their arguments are weak, to be honest with you. And we'll get to a couple yeah. of those, but um, one of them, the first one that I hear most often is that uh, the church is not exempt from tribulation. The, the church is not exempt from going through hard things. There's no promise to the believer that we won't experience uh, tribulation. Uh, but And you and I get this question a lot at conferences, and, and we always share with people like, yes, Christians will go through tribulation, but there's a, yeah. there's a world of difference between general tribulation and the tribulation. Yeah. So it has to do with a, a misunderstanding of this time, the time of Jacob's trouble, this time of the mm -hmm. seven year specific time of God's wrath on earth mm -hmm. um, yeah. versus general tribulation. Yeah. You kind of have two categories of people there. There are people that say that, uh, that there is no tribulation in the future, that there is no literal antichrist. There, there's mm -hmm. no 
Uh, there, there's no seal trumpet bowl judgments. All, all these, they don't exist. Well, if that doesn't exist, then yeah, you, so the rapture doesn't exist either. Maybe a lot of things don't exist if those things don't exist uh, because we're looking at the Bible from a particular standpoint. Uh, but there are others who say, no, we believe strongly that there is a tribulation. It's just that there's no pre-trib rapture. But but let's let's admit what we would all agree on is that Christians go through tribulation. Uh, in fact, Jesus said that in, in John 16, 33, he says, in the world, you have tribulation, but take courage, I've overcome the world. So, so Christ tells us ahead of time, of course, the, you know, the, the knowledge of, that we have about the prophets and, and the, the chronicles of the prophets tell us there's persecution. I mean, hello, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, I mean, Elijah being sawn in two. I mean, there's so many things that tell us we go through tribulation and even today, right now, in over 60 countries, Christians are being persecuted. So no one is saying that Christians don't go through hard times. It's not a name it and claim it uh, theology here. That's right. Uh, it, it's a, it's simply saying that there is a big difference between man's wrath, which is lowercase t, tribulation, and God's hatred and fury uh, that is coming to planet Earth. That's mm-hmm. capital T, tribulation. They come from God. And so that's the distinction that we're making. We're not we're not just simply writing ourselves out of the tribulation because we don't want to be there. Uh, obviously, we don't want to be. Who? No one wants to be there. That's right. But at the same time, Todd, it's it's not a just a convenience uh, doctrine. Uh, and, right. and as we're going to look in right now, it, it's something that we actually see in Scripture. So, what are some of the scriptures that we can point to uh, that would tell us that we're not going to experience God's wrath uh, in the tribulation? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, Revelation 3.10 is one that that specifically says we'll be saved from the hour of trial, which is coming on the whole world. So it's talking about a, a specific time, a specific, a specific time where the, God's wrath is literally coming on the whole earth. Um, but the, the key uh, verse is, well, there's two of them. One's 1 Corinthians 15.52. It says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed and the flash and the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised perishable and we will be changed for the per- perishable must clothe itself with imperishable and the mortal with immortality. So that, that gives us the, the first indication there that, you know, there's this time when every, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed. And then Paul, same, same apostle gives us more key information. And then we'll go back and talk about uh, yeah. Jesus kind of tipped his hat to the rapture as well. But the key, the key verse, the key passage is 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. Mm-hmm. And it says crystal clear, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together. There's our word harpazo. Mm-hmm. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So we're meeting him in the air. It's not when he returns. We're meeting him in, in between. And then we go to be with him. Um, so those are, those are the key passages uh, yeah. about the rapture. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple more to in, in the Thessalonians because Paul wrote mm-hmm. Thessalonians to them and he, he covered extensively eschatology with them. He was only with them a minimum of three weeks. Uh, but he, according to second Thessalonians two, five, he says, don't you remember while I was with you, I was telling you these things, the verb tense there, I was telling you over and over again. And in that passage, he's talking about antichrist, the day of the Lord, the restrainer being removed, the deception of antichrist, all these things are going on. But in first Thess one, uh, verse 10, he says, um, and to wait for his son from heaven, Okay, so there's Jesus coming back for us, Mm -hmm. whom he raised from the dead. That is Christ uh, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Mm -hmm. There it is right there. The wrath that is coming, we get delivered from it. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it says over in uh, chapter 5 in verse uh, verse 9, it says, and this is the whole context here is the day of the Lord. It's the tribulation. Mm -hmm. He says, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That word salvation there is, uh, it means deliverance, it means to be delivered from something. So we could even find places in scripture where if you just, you know, do the comparison where, yeah, there were times where God allowed believers to go through things, uh, but it was always man's wrath. 
Mm-hmm. But the other times he delivered them from. He delivered Noah from the flood. He delivered Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah before his wrath came. He didn't just say, I'm just going to let Lot be incinerated with everybody else. Mm-hmm. So those are some key scriptures there. And I would say too, Todd, just from a theological perspective, that we believe that all of the wrath of God fell on Christ at the cross. Mm-hmm. And he cried out, it is finished, paid in full to Telestai. And because of that, Technically, God the Father cannot repunish sin when sin's already been punished. Mm -hmm. So he's not going to repunish us for our sin when Romans 8, 1 says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So theologically, you have a real problem with saying God's going to punish Jesus for sin, and then he's going to punish believers again for the same sin. That doesn't hold up theologically. So you've got that going on. Then you've got just the clear statement that we're not going to go through God's wrath. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you say, well, is that a is that just like a convenient escape clause? Well, convenient or not, it is an escape clause. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't don't tell Lot it was convenient. I mean, Lot's going, I'm glad that I didn't mm-hmm. die, you know, in Sodom and Gomorrah. So uh, so those are some some, I think, some doctrinal and some scriptural theological passages that help us kind of under underpin this argument mm-hmm. uh, about the uh, the fact that we're going to be delivered from God's wrath. Yeah. Amen. I, I think that's crystal clear. And you and I have a, a mutual friend who uh, I was talking with a few weeks ago and, and he said he, he, there's a few people he kind of pressed the argument with, like once they wouldn't budge on the fact that we, we got to go through God's wrath. He said, well, well, why, what's the purpose if God, if Jesus paid it all. And when it came down to it, a, a few people said to him, well, I, I still need to pay for some of my sins. So it becomes mm-hmm. almost like a, a, a Protestant form of purgatory. Like yeah. I'm still not good enough, but mm-hmm. That, that goes back to the root of soteriology, salvation yes. itself. We've got, yeah. we have to understand as believers, mm-hmm. we are forgiven 100%. There's not an mm-hmm. ounce of our sin we have to pay for. Jesus right. paid it all. If, yeah. we, if we even try to take credit for it, <laughs> that we can mm-hmm. somehow pay for some of our sins, that does injustice to the cross. That does violence yeah. to the, the work of Christ on the cross. When yeah. he was hung on the cross, I think you may have mentioned this already. He said, mm-hmm. it is mm-hmm. finished. Mm-hmm. completely finished. There's nothing we have to do. I think that's yeah. as believers, we need to have that security. We need to lean into yeah. that, grasp that and understand that and synthesize that with what we learn about the rapture and God's wrath yeah. and that kind of thing. So very yeah. important aspect of it. Absolutely, brother. And for, from my perspective, it's like for God to to punish us for our sins with his wrath he has to then turn to his son in heaven and apologize to Jesus and say, I really didn't accept your payment for their sin. Mm. Uh, and we know that's not going to happen yeah. because uh, Hebrews 7, 24 says Christ ever lives to intercede for us. Uh, another argument that people make, and this is another one you hear, and, and this is a one that is, that is uh, I think people who are not biblically grounded, historically grounded, will go, wow, that sounds convincing is the idea that the belief in the rapture came in the 1830s from a man by the name of John Nelson Darby. Yeah. And uh, people say, well, this is where it all came from. He, he got a message from a demon-possessed girl, and, <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden he invented this whole idea uh, of the rapture. And uh, this, is, uh, this is simply not true. It is not yeah. where the rapture began. Um, historically, as you look at church history, there are times, if you look at really the, the mess of church history, there are times when certain doctrines rose to the surface and became popular or not popular at certain times. Uh, certainly when Martin Luther said, hey, justification is by faith. We're saved by grace through faith alone, not by works. As the Catholic Church had been teaching for a thousand years, that mm-hmm. certainly sounded like a recent doctrine. In fact, it was a brand new doctrine to mm-hmm. most. And so... Uh, so yeah, so so you look at the 1830s, you know, and and for Darby to sort of systematize and and for him to begin, and he didn't get it from a DM possessed girl, uh, <laughs> but for him to, um, and this argument, by the way, has is so tired and old, it's been yep. debunked. People keep bringing it out of mothballs yeah. to try to give I'm it life again. I'm surprised they still try to use it. Yeah, they dig up the grave of this argument and try to <laughs> breathe air into this corpse of an argument. Yep. Uh, it's simply not true, and and the way we know it's not true is because. Uh, the early church fathers believed in mm-hmm. a, a pre-tribulational 
uh, deliverance. Uh, in fact, um, you have all the way back, this is from an article, uh, actually a journal entry by uh, Dr. Tommy Ice, a good friend of ours. Uh, he's talking about Irenaeus, and Irenaeus was a disciple mm -hmm. of Polycarp, who was a disciple of the Apostle John. So these mm -hmm. guys are directly connected. So it's kind of like whatever John told Polycarp uh, in terms of the timing of the, of the rapture, then Polycarp told Irenaeus. This is what Irenaeus mm -hmm. said. Uh, he says that he lived from AD 130 to 202. He says, and therefore, where, when in the end the church shall be suddenly caught up from this, it is said, then there shall be tribulation such as not been since the beginning, uh, nor shall be. That's just one example. Uh, and they're discovering more and more church fathers. In fact, the new book by our good friend Lee, Bl Lee Brainerd, who's going to be on our podcast, uh, Lee has written a, a great book about evidence for the pre-trib rapture from the church fathers. So uh, if you want to search in history, if that's the argument you want to make, if you want to go the Darby route, mm -hmm. then we can trump you pretty easily on that one. Yeah. But Todd, the bottom line is, as you and I always say, it's really not even what church history says. What does the Bible say? Amen. So we have to always go back to scripture, ground our thoughts in the scripture, because that's where our confidence comes from. So true. That That's the bottom line is what does the Bible say? Letting it speak clearly. Um, and yeah, there, there, I did some research as well, pulling from some of our other friends. Uh, there's a book by uh, our friend who's gone with the Lord now, Ed Heinsohn mm -hmm. and uh, Mark Hitchcock, and they detail some of those same ones in, yes. that you mentioned. And also the Didache, the teaching of the 12. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very clear pre-trib rapture uh, statements. Yeah, that's, that's early. And then, that's late first century there. Yeah, late century, first century. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and then they're even finding, now that now that people are actually looking for it in other periods of history, they're finding more and more of these documents. Mm -hmm. And here's an interesting one I came across that is from, um, let's see. Here's one from uh, Pseudo Ephraim, a Syrian church mm -hmm. father, somewhere in the fourth to sense, uh, seventh century. And it says, here's the quote. This is a pretty clear cut one. We ought to understand thoroughly, therefore, my brothers, what is imminent and prepare ourselves for the meeting of the Lord Jesus Christ. For all the saints and elect of God are gathered together before the tribulation, which mm -hmm. is to come and taken yeah. to the Lord. Yeah. So throughout church history, it, now that we're looking for it because of this goofy Darby argument that keeps popping up, <laughs> I love the analogy used of it. It's a corpse that people keep digging up and bringing. Here, here's here's the Darby argument. No, that thing's right. been shot so many times. Right. Just leave it in the grave. It doesn't yeah. it doesn't hold water. But like you said, it sounds intellectual. It sounds academic. So when people first hear it, if they haven't heard that argument before, uh, they get taken by it or, or their their faith is shaken in the rapture. And that's why we're we're doing this. So, yeah. so yeah, that, that argument is dead, dead, dead. Uh, it can be, you know, proven wrong so easily. And there's one more, and this was, this was when I watched just today, I saw it a few weeks ago and this was from a guy and his argument was, and let me pull up my notes cause I want to make sure I, I kind of mm -hmm. quote some of the stuff he said, right. His argument was that the, the rapture is not even in the Bible. Of course he talks about the Olivet discourse that in that case, it's talking about the people left behind or those left behind for judgment, which you and I would agree with because mm -hmm. he's talking to Jewish believers uh, about the tribulation period. And that clearly is not the rapture in view there. But then he goes and he, and he actually breaks down uh, second or first Thess, uh, four with the passage we just read with the detailed description of the rapture. And he, he, he says, no, this is just the Perugia that was commonly known at that time where when a king or a dignitary would come to town, throngs of people would join him and then he would go into the city. Uh, and I'm, and the whole time I'm thinking, yes, amen. He's taken us to the celestial city yeah. talked about it in, in, in the book of Hebrews. He's taking us home to be with the father that mm -hmm. exactly what Jesus talked about in John 14. So uh, even the arguments, and this was a very intellectual sounding argument, very polished mm -hmm. video with motion graphics and all this stuff, mm -hmm. really making a case and kind of making fun of the left behind series and anything related to the pre-trib rapture that no, we literally, he, and he, he did admit we do go up in the air, but then we come right back down with the Lord to go mm -hmm. rule the world, you know, go into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, but what this argument fails to do is synthesize all the other necessary passages and it, and it, it leaves more questions than answers. So in other words, people who are like this often cherry pick one particular verse, put their own thoughts and meaning into it without synthesizing it or looking at the broader context of scripture. Uh, so again, if you, if, anytime you hear an argument, 
take your time, listen to the argument and use, use your God given logic and intellect and compare scripture with scripture and see if it checks all the boxes and answers all the, all the questions. Um, so yeah. that, that one was, was more disturbing to me than the Darby argument because the Darby argument, people just paired it because they've heard it. Yeah. This one was a, a really seasoned theologian yeah. who really was trying to honestly twist scripture to meet his own expectations and make mm -hmm. fun of the rapture. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think I know who you're talking about there. I had to read some of his books from, from my doctoral work and I'm just like, mm. Oh, this is a, this is a big stretch here. Actually, uh, I you, think there's two, there's two guys. There's that okay. guy. And then there's another guy, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. other guy. Yeah. We, we don't name people on here cause that's yeah, what yeah. we're about, but we're, we're trying to yeah. equip our listeners right. to, to see truth for themselves and to mm -hmm. be able to look at these things objectively scripturally right. and say, no, that doesn't line up with scripture. Yeah. It's crystal clear in scripture. Yeah. Well, at, at best, at best, an argument like that would be a post-tribulational argument that, yeah. that we would go through the tribulation, that Christ would rapture us, we go to heaven, change, do a quick change of clothes, uh, come <laughs> back down on, on white horses in, instantaneously. Uh, there, there are scores of problems with that view, uh, mm -hmm. not the least of which is how do people have babies in the millennial kingdom if we're all glorified at the end of the tribulation through the post-trib mm -hmm. rapture. But, uh, but at worst, it's an argument that is based upon a non-literal approach to the scriptures. In other words, they have to allegorize almost everything. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the only thing they don't allegorize is the fact that Christ himself actually comes back. But most of what, what they do is they, there's no antichrist. There's no, uh, there's no seven year tribulation. There's no literal seal trumpet bowl judgments. There's no global government. It's kind of, there is no six, six, six. It's just in your mind kind of thing. And, and, uh, that, I've heard that that pastor say that it's just the, the mark of the beast is just thinking worldly. That's what that means, you wow. know, kind of thing. Uh, but gracious. anyway, all that to say, if that's true, then wow, who who could possibly make any sense of revelation? Who becomes the trusted authority on yep. what all these symbols, hundreds and hundreds of symbols, might mean? Uh, mm -hmm. Why not just take God at His word and let the plain sense speak sense? and believe what he says. Uh, again, we are, we're fine with people having different views on the timing of the rapture. We can have healthy discussions about that. And, and many, many godly people, you know, believe that, uh, we don't, uh, we believe it's a specific time before the, the tribulation, but the fact that the rapture is in the Bible, you cannot deny that there is an event, call it whatever you want to. Okay. Call it yeah. the great snatching away. Call it the harpazo. <laughs> call it what the Bible calls it, the blessed hope. Mm -hmm. uh, call it the uh, the parousia. I mean, that word parousia is used uh, multiple times in the New Testament, and sometimes it refers to the second coming, and sometimes it refers to the fir to the uh, mm -hmm. uh, to the rapture. Context will tell you which it's referring to. And so that's why, again, you know, just studying the scripture in its context and finding out, you know, which coming of Christ is he talking about? And then when you compare all those parousia passages, which means coming, presence or arrival, when you compare those in the scripture, they don't match up because mm -hmm. some of these, some of the coming here over here, it says Jesus says he comes at this time. Then he says he comes at that time. So you've got two separate appearances of Christ. And mm -hmm. that also is undeniable uh, with the differences between the rapture and the second coming. I mean, there's mm -hmm. just there are dozens and dozens of differences between those two events. So that's why studying the Bible in its context is so, so critical. Yeah, it really is. And in a couple of our books, Jeff, we have a side by side comparison chart mm -hmm. of, of the details of the rapture yeah. and the second coming. Uh, and and that that's where you said they have to allegorize it. They have to explain it away some somehow. And that's no small feat. And that's dangerous ground, in my opinion. I would could not imagine having to answer to the Lord for allegorizing scripture that was meant to be literal and clearly meant for us to understand. So why do you think all this is happening right now at this time? Like after, you know, roughly 150, 200 years of the rapture being not controversial. Now, all of a sudden here, as we yeah. see all these other end time developments, the rapture is under attack. Yeah. Well, I think it's pretty clear. I think one would be this, Todd, is that uh, the rapture in some 
in some ways is in, is beginning to enjoy a resurgence. It's not the most popular mm-hmm. doctrine. Don't don't go there with it. Uh, but uh, people think, well, it's it's popular, therefore I'm going to attack it. You know, because it can't be true. And mm-hmm. granted, there have been some portrayals of the rapture in different movies and things like that that are kind of on the <laughs> on the cheese scale. Okay, if you yeah. know what I mean, it's just kind of kind of campy. True. You know, so I get that. You know, mm-hmm. um, but not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I think if you were Satan and you really wanted to hurt the bride of Christ, you would keep her from knowing she has a wedding day. Mm. You would prevent her from knowing that she needs to go get a dress and Mm -hmm. that the groom's going to come back for her and rescue her and take her to the father's house and celebrate uh, the marriage. I would keep that information from the bride if I were Satan. Mm -hmm. And that certainly is what's happening here. Uh, People are taking some of the sensational views about the rapture or the date setting that people have made. I get that. We're against that as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, But they're using that uh, to to basically hide the wedding day from the bride. And uh, if I were the groom, That would make me very upset Mm -hmm. if someone didn't let me tell my bride that we were going to get married. Uh, And I think that's what a lot of people are doing. Some pastors are even keeping that information from them. So, um, so again, I I think it's, that's one reason I think Satan is really behind. Ultimately, I think there's some ignorance as well Mm -hmm. uh, that's involved and people just don't know. And then I think like people we've talked about, there's actually misinterpretation of scripture and misinformation. Mm-hmm. that's being uh, put out there as well. So that's why, you know, listen, I, you know, I said the other day, I was at a church, I said, you know, people say certain doctrines are controversial when you get to eschatology. Listen, truth is controversial. Mm-hmm. Truth by its very nature will put a yeah. dividing line down the middle of the room between mm-hmm. those who accept it and those who don't. So it's okay sometimes to be uh, divided uh, with people that don't believe the truth. I mean, we don't want to be divisive, you know, we don't that's mean right. spirited or anything, Todd. But the bottom line is uh, this truth will divide. And so yep. uh, we love those who don't agree with us. That's fine. But if you deny the raptures in the Bible, then you're wrong. Yep, exactly. So, Jeff, I think we can officially say this myth is busted. <laughs> yeah. The rapture is crystal clear in the Bible. You cannot get away from it. It's even a slow motion, step-by-step description given it, given uh, there in, in First S4. So uh, that myth is busted, and uh, we're happy to say uh, we look forward to the rapture and we're ready for it whenever the Lord wants to come. Amen. And and yep. again, there are many other great books about it that, that go into much greater detail than we can in you know, 28 oh, yeah. minutes or 30 minutes or whatever mm-hmm. on a program. Uh, Mark Hitchcock at Heinsohn have written a great book. Uh, mm-hmm. Dr. John Walford, uh, Charles Ryrie. I mean, there are many great books out there uh, on the rapture that you can get. And so mm-hmm. I encourage you to, to check those out. And, and most of all, just, you know, read your Bible. And yeah. ask the hard questions, you know, that's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, who, who are these people in the, in the tribulation that become Christians? Are they just, are they us or are they become Christians after, you know, the rapture? These are good mm-hmm. things to study. And yep. uh, so, the, and, and the more that we study, the more confidence we're going to have uh, on our position. And again, we want to be clear that, you know, we're not, we're not trying to divide the body of Christ in terms of we, we don't want to create an us and them uh, type of thing. Uh, right. But at some point, you know, you have to stand for the truth. And mm-hmm. uh, because a lot of people in the body of Christ, are, they don't know how to stand or they don't want yeah. to stand. Uh, in fact, Second Peter 3 says, in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking. It's like, well, Peter, what are they going to mock? He says they're going to mock the coming of the Lord. Where's the promise of his coming? Because your Jesus hadn't come back for 2000 years. So mm-hmm. jokes on you, Christian. And we're just like, well, keep reading that passage. And God is saying he's waiting for you to repent. And because he wants you to be a part of that bride too. Yeah. I'm glad you said that too, about the divisiveness. That's, that's not our heartbeat. Mm -hmm. We have the the protective, uh, loving care of those who listen to us, kind of like Paul did with the Thessalonians saying, I don't want you to be shaken in your faith. That's right. And that's, what's behind this. It's, we're not Mm -hmm. attacking anybody to be attacking anybody. That's why we don't say names. But we want to defend the fact that the rapture is in the Bible. And we all often defend the pre-trip rapture because we believe that's crystal clear yeah. uh, as well. And, and those are not your salvation is, is not based on whether you believe those things. Right. But those are things that are super important to us. They were super important to Paul, super important throughout Scripture. So we believe we need to, like you said, uh, Jeff, stand on truth regardless of, of how that uh, comes across. We don't want to be mean spirited, but we want to cut a clear line and, and yeah. divide 
the Lord's word correctly. Yeah. Uh, and I don't want to forget, we want to thank uh, Harvest House uh, Publishers for backing this podcast. And uh, make sure you go to harvestprophecyhq.com to check out all kinds of great resources they have. Some of the books we mentioned, some other things that you can dive deeper into this topic and kind of have a, uh, some great things to help further equip you uh, as you study these things. Absolutely. And we're so grateful for them. And that's the thing, Todd, is that, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that we say what the Bible says uh, and we, we don't, we don't sensationalize things. Uh, we don't date set soft or hard date setting. We don't get into, he has to come back by 2028 20, or whatever it might mm -hmm. be. No, God's in charge of the timing in terms of, of when he comes back and before the rapture, but uh, we, we, before the tribulation rather, but we do believe that, uh, that, that there is a pre tribulational deliverance. And because you know what? The Bible never tells Christians to look for antichrist. It only tells them to look for the Christ and to wait and to be expectant. And uh, in one of my books, Wake the Bride, I, I give a list of about two dozen passages in the New Testament that give evidence of the fact that the early church w was eager and they anticipated the coming of the Lord at any time. And that would be in a pre-trib sense, in a sense of, of the yeah. doctrine of imminence. So again, we want to be in this, that same Maranatha spirit as the uh, early church and to spread the word, Jesus Christ is coming back. Mm. Amen. And listen, um, we're also doing uh, kind of a new feature here on the podcast beginning with this season, and we're calling them shout outs, at least right now. We might come up with a cooler name, but right now they're <laughs> shout outs. Many of you have made comments. <laughs> on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. And uh, we want to thank you for those. We want to cite a couple of those. So, so every episode from here on out, we're planning to, uh, do, to cover at least two of those, to call one or uh, two of you by name, uh, mention your shout out and um, I mean, mention your comment and give you a shout out and thank you for listening to the podcast. Amen. So we can... and absolutely. In fact, let me just give a shout out right now. This is, uh, this is a friend of ours from a Facebook uh, post. Um, uh, her name is Miana. And uh, Miana says, I was there and I, what an amazing day. She said, if you get a chance, go to a pop-up conference. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Todd and I are traveling all over the place. We're getting ready to head, head north to Canada. And, and anyway, all that to say is uh, you come to a pop-up conference, you're going to take a sip of water from a fire hydrant. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> and so Miana, thank you so much for coming, being a part of it. And uh, we hope to meet you again and others like you at future pop-up conferences. Yes, indeed. And here's one uh, taken from a comment on uh, YouTube. A lot of people, you can listen to our podcast, but you can also watch them on YouTube. And this was from uh, season 13, episode six, the acceleration of end time signs. And this was when we had uh, a guest on Jan Markell, mm -hmm. who will actually have one again this season. So stay mm -hmm. tuned for that. Uh, but this, this comment was from Christine Hernandez. So Christine, thank you for taking the time to, to share this comment. And Christine said, Thank you for all of the teachings and information. My faith in Jesus Christ and walk with God has been growing as a result of this podcast. Tom mm -hmm. Hughes, Jack Hibbs, Don, and so many godly leaders. I'm so thankful for all of you. Uh, thank you, Christine, for that. Uh, we're, we're encouraged to hear how this impacts other people. And we're also encouraged to hear some of our other friends. We know all, all those people uh, that you mentioned. They're great friends of ours, mm -hmm. uh, great people who teach Bible prophecy. So it's good to hear that there's a, a small community of people who are teaching Bible prophecy in a thoroughly yes. biblical way and are, yeah. are meeting the need of the day. So thank you for sharing that and stay tuned and uh, keep listening, keep watching. Yeah, thank you guys so much and for the encouragement you give us because as we meet you around the country, uh, it, it some of you are saying, "Listen, you, you, you guys helped bring me back to God. I was I was way off the, you know, the beaten path, and and, and your your podcast uh, helped me come back to God. So I want to thank all of you for listening and thank you for spreading the word. Uh, share this podcast, uh, like it, do all those social media things just for the reason to help get the truth out there uh, to tell people about the hope that's found in Jesus Christ." Hmm. Amen. So thank y'all so much for listening and stay tuned for episode two coming up next week of season 14 of the Prophecy Pros podcast. <laughs>